Hello and welcome back my friends. This video is part four of a video series I've been putting together sharing with you how you can build your very own pond in your backyard or a fish pond like what I have here. It's quite easy to do. In videos one, two, and three I share with you how to dig out the pond, how to insert a rubber pond liner, and then how to rock the pond and create this nice natural appearance. Today what I wanted to share with you is adding water into the pond, uh, the way I go about doing that and to keep it safe for the fish. Also adding in aquatic plants to your pond. Also different filtration methods and the fountains that I'm using here. I wanted to go into a bit of detail on that. So after watching this part four of this video series, you'll have all the information you need to get going and build something very similar to what you see here. So in the last video we left off, I had rocked the whole pond and I rinsed off all the rocks of any dirt and debris and pumped that dirty water out. So we're going to talk about filling the pond. So when it comes to actually adding water into your pond, what you want to do is make sure that you're using a fresh water source that doesn't have chlorine or chloramines in there that can kill bacteria that we're colonizing in the pond. Even though we're starting from scratch, you don't want to have a chlorinated or a, a water pond full of chloramines that you're adding fish into either. So the way that we deal with that is we add in what's called a pond conditioner. And I'm going to share with you what I use. So this here is called Pond Prime, and it removes chlorine, chloramine, and ammonia. And just a very small amount of this does the job. Uh, what you need is about an eighth of a cup to treat 600 gallons of water. And so you can do the math and divide that down according to the size of your pond or uh, multiply it up. So this pond here was approximately 400 gallons. And the way I calculated that, now you can add a meter at your spigot source uh, that can meter how much water flow you have if you want to measure the water that your pond is actually um, taking up that way or you can do another technique which I use which is very simple and that is to get yourself some sort of a vessel in my case I used this 32 gallon trash can and I filled the water up in this vessel first and then pumped it into the pond and by doing it that way I was able to calculate the total amount of gallons that I needed to fill this pond, which is important because it helps me to calculate how much pond conditioner I'm going to use to treat the water. So for every 35 gallons of water or 32 gallons of water that I was filling this up with, I was adding just about a quarter teaspoon of this pond conditioner. Like I said, just a few drops treats the water and then I'd pump it into the pond. So my pump setup is this here. I've got a sump pump. This is a Drummond pump. I uh, picked it up at Harbor Freight. I think it's like $25, but there's all sorts of different transfer and sump pumps that you can use to transfer your water in. Uh, you can find these online or locally. And then you're just gonna need to get yourself a hose. I've got a rubber hose here, a 20 foot hose, and that's gonna connect to the top of the sump pump. And then the other end feeds into the pond. So this is a really easy way to pump water in or out of your pond if you're doing a water change. So just get yourself a trash can, some pond conditioner, a sump pump, and a hose, and you're gonna be able to do 90% of the maintenance that's required on a fish pond like this. Okay, so now you got your pond full of fresh water. There's no chlorine, chloramines in there. So what's next? Well, you wanna add some plants to give it a nice vibrant appearance. But besides that, the plants are also helping to oxygenate the water and they're also working as a biofilter, helping to filter out some of the different debris that's going to accumulate in the pond. Uh, also the fish, if you're adding fish into your pond, love to have that added shelter to go under the plants and hide and it gives them some more shade and it just helps them to feel safe and happy. And oftentimes I'll catch them nibbling on the roots of these water lettuce, for example. They like to gather under these plants and nibble on these roots. So this plant here is called water lettuce. And when it comes to your pond plants, you can do a local search on Google. Uh, just put in your zip code and pond plants and see if you can find anything nearby. Another option is to order your plants online. So uh, whatever works for you. But I really like these plants here. These are an annual. They will multiply. You can see here's a little one growing here. Eventually they'll divide on their own and multiply, but they don't overwinter. Uh, the other plants that I have in the pond do overwinter. Something else cool about some of these plants, like you can see here, 
uh, the bees are coming and landing on these water lettuce like a little island and they're getting themselves a drink. So the pond makes a great habitat, not only for fish, but the bees come in and get a drink. The paper wasps, which are beneficial to gardeners, will come in and get a drink. You'll see hummingbirds fluttering around in the fountain here, getting a drink, taking a shower. And uh, dragonflies really like to hang out in this area as well, specifically for the microclimate. But other than the water lettuce, you can see we've got a beautiful lily back there in the corner with a bright pink flower that's opened up. In the afternoon, the flower will open up and close back up in the evening. So the water lily is a perennial plant and it will multiply. Each year, uh, you can divide some of these plants and repot them up, but it's quite beautiful. Again, it creates that shelter for the fish and you've got the beautiful flowers as well. Just behind the lily, you can see we've got what's known as four leaf clover. Really cool. If you ever had a hard time finding a four leaf clover uh, to bring some luck to you, well, you can actually buy the plant and it will perennialize in a pond system like this. So you can see how it's kind of worked its way into the rocks. Uh, I put that into the system a couple years ago. We also got some frog bit over there. It's another uh, floating plant and some sweet flag. There's other plants that also do well in and out of the pond system, whether it's on one of these pond shelves or right outside on the border. Plants like the society flower or society garlic are both drought tolerant and can handle saturated roots. So you can put this either in or outside of the pond. Uh, right behind here, it's a little past its prime, but we've got gladiolas, which again will grow in or out of the pond system. So there's so many different possibilities to beautifying your pond, different plants you can use. If you can find a local source, they're gonna be the experts that can help you to decide what plants are gonna do the best for you and maybe perennialize in your system but I'm sure you can find good information online with some of the suppliers as well. All right, so you've added water into your pond. You've included some wonderful plants. Things are looking good. And now you're thinking about adding some fish. Well, there's different options. A lot of folks are familiar with adding koi fish. And a lot of folks, when they see my fish in my pond, think that they're koi when in fact, they're comet goldfish. And I'm gonna turn off the fountain so that we can get a better look at the fish there. But one of the reasons I chose Comet Goldfish were, for one, the upfront cost is a lot lower and it's a very similar looking fish, but they're also uh, quite cold hardy. And these fish do well in this area. We do get below freezing every winter. We've gotten down into the low 20s and these fish have survived just fine over the winter. So I found this was the best solution for my pond situation. But the Comet Goldfish, like I said, they can handle temperatures down below freezing. Now the pond itself never froze, in part because it's a larger mass of water and we usually don't stay below freezing for extended periods of time. And we also have the fountains going on, which is causing a disturbance and helps to prevent some of the uh, pond from freezing. Also the pumps put out a little bit of heat. But again, do your research, figure out what you might want to add into your pond system. I'm a big fan of the Comet Goldfish. They're just beautiful fish. They're fun to watch and we've been very happy. Now, as long as I have the fountain turned off and you can clearly see, I just wanna show you my filtration and fountain system here. So what I have there is a milk crate that's filled with gravel of various size. And I have the pump and the fountain submerged in that gravel. So the gravel is actually working as the filtration system. What happens is, as the pump is sucking water through those rocks, it's grabbing on to all the different fish waste and debris, and bacteria, beneficial bacteria, is also colonizing on those rocks and helping to create a balanced ecosystem and helping to keep the pond clear as well. So just simple gravel will work very well as a source of filtration. You don't need a skimmer, in my opinion, for a pond this size. Maybe if you put your pond under a tree that's dropping a lot of leaves, that can be helpful. But just a little net to take anything off the surface when you need to do that can be helpful, but you really don't need a skimmer. You don't need any fancy filter bags or boxes. 
All you need is some gravel and a couple pumps that are installed. In this case, I've got the fountain that's pumping water through. And over here, I've got a pond spitter, which is also being operated. There's a pump and a small little pond basket there. Just covered with gravel. And I recently reset this system. I usually pull these boxes out about three times a year and I will blast off those rocks, clean them, which makes great fertilizer for the garden, by the way. All the debris that you get off these rocks, uh, you can use that in the garden. And then I just replace the system, clean the pumps. Um, I will go over that in detail in a future video, so stay tuned. This video here, part four, is all about the build and how to get things set up, but I will be making videos in the future as well about some of the different maintenance that I do and things like that, so stay tuned for that. So this pump and fountain setup here is the Laguna PowerJet 600. I've been very happy with this product here. That ring around the top is a separate LED light ring I picked up at Home Depot. Um, it's actually the second one that I've gone through and the lights keep going out so it's not the best of quality. I wouldn't really recommend that. When it was fully working it was nice because it would shine a bright light up into the fountain. Now just a couple of those LEDs go off so I might have to come up with another solution. But uh, the pond pump and uh, fountain itself is great. It's made for a pond between six and 1200 gallons. And like I said, this pond's only 400 gallons. I don't find it to be overkill at all. I find it to be uh, the perfect size. It does a great job helping to filter out the water and keep it nice and clear. As you can see, we've got a, a great clarity in this pond here. And this over here is just a turtle pond spitter. You can get this at some Home Depots. You can get it on Amazon. And I also bought a uh, 400 gallon per hour pump that, like I said, is placed into those gravel rocks in a smaller pond basket. And this isn't just for decoration. This does a couple different things. For one, it's helping to filter out the water. And the other thing it's doing is creating this disturbance on the surface of the water. So we're not getting any stagnation. We're making sure that there's no possible way that we're gonna have any mosquitoes taking home here laying eggs. So this is oxygenating the water and it's stopping uh, the water from becoming stagnant in this little cove area here. So I found that that was necessary. Originally, I just had the, the fountain here and I wasn't getting any ripples back in this cove. And so I added in the spitter. I think it looks nice. And again, uh, helps with the filtration, adds more oxygen. The fish actually like to hang out and swim right where that uh, spitter starts to hit the water there. So they like the disturbance and it just makes sure that we're not gonna ever have any mosquitoes come into this pond system. So they only come in if the water's stagnant. So if I were to leave the fountain off over here for an extended period of time, there's a good chance that some mosquitoes would start to lay some eggs over in here. So I'm gonna turn back on the fountain again. Something else worth mentioning is that with the pond spitter, I had to get uh, three different components to get it to work. You got the pond spitter, and I also had to buy some half inch PVC tubing, which connects to the 400 gallon per hour pump. So that black tubing you see coming out of that little pond basket with the gravel is the half inch tubing. And you can get that in 20, 50, 100 foot lengths, depending on the distance you're running there. So you need the pump, the tubing, and the spitter. As far as this fountain goes, it was just plug and play. It has the pump and the fountain all connected. You just plug it in and you're running. So that's all there is to it. Once you've done all these different steps, you're in business. Uh, of course, there's different variations that you could put into your pond design. Uh, you can add in lighting, for example. I do have a couple different spotlights. I do need to clean them off. Maybe you can see that one there, covered with some algae. I do have some overhead lighting. Here I've got some LED bulbs draping around the pond, and that's nice. Uh, my favorite lighting setup actually was this light ring in the fountain when it works. It would shoot that light up into the water streams. It looked really nice. But you can get very creative and fancy and add different lighting and that sort of thing. Well, that's going to do it for this video and conclude the pond build series. All the videos one through four can be found in a playlist on my channel for easy viewing. In the end, I have to say, 
This project was well worth it. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. I jumped into this without having any experience and I'm really happy with the way things turned out. I think your average person could have equal amount of success. It's just a little bit of sweat on the brow and you can get one of these built, but if you have any hindrances, you could obviously hire different sections of this out. You don't have to hire the whole pond build out, but maybe bringing in some of the bigger boulders or some of the digging. But the rest of it, you know, filling it, maintaining it, putting in the pond uh, filters and fountains and adding in the fish, anyone could do this. I gotta say, it's been so rewarding Having this water feature out in our backyard is so nice to come out here, relax, uh, just get away from it all. The sound of the flowing water, looking at the fish, uh, just feeling uh, the climate change when you're near the pond. It's its own little microclimate. It's just so nice to be out here now. And anytime I'm feeling like I just need to get away for a minute, I come out next to the pond and it's like I'm transformed into a whole nother location. So uh, highly recommend it. Alice did a lot of the filming on this last episode. Sure to appreciate she's been doing a good job handling the camera. And sweetie, let me just ask you, what's your favorite part about having a fish pond in the backyard? Well, I am drinking tea while I am looking the fish. And it makes me entertainment. So there you have it, folks. So with that, we want to thank you for watching. Have yourself a great rest of the day. Until next time, this is Dan from plantabundance.com. Take care, we'll be talking to you again soon.